Hi, I'm Tristan, this is Magic May Yard Maple, and right now we're thinking about the science behind beer. Food shots. So like the rest of the UK, we're on lockdown right now, but the sun is shining, it's a bank holiday, so we're going to break out the homebrew kit and make ourselves a batch of ale. Specifically, we're going to make a batch of my Lemon Porridge IPA. So called because I include rolled oats as part of the mash and I use lots of citra hops to give a fresh citrusy flavour. The written history of beer goes back to ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia. And when you think about it, the benefit of this beverage to these fast growing cereal farming civilizations were enormous. To make any alcoholic beverage, we need a foodstuff that's naturally high in carbohydrate. This could be sweet fruits like apple or grapes or it could be a starchy cereal. Yeast ferments sugars to predominantly ethanol and carbon dioxide, making a fizzy, flavoursome drink that is calorie dense and has a long shelf life. The alcohol content is also typically sufficient to decrease the growth of pathogenic bacteria, meaning that beer was a relatively safe alternative in times and places where clean drinking water was not readily available. Today, beer represents almost 40% of all UK alcohol sales value a market that was worth an estimated £46 billion in 2017. However, unlike cider or wine, beer is a difficult beverage to make by accident, mainly because we need to convert the starch in the grain to easily fermentable sugars. The first step of making beer is the malting process. Beer is typically made from malted barley. We start by steeping the grains in water, so to trick them into germinating. After we see the first shoots formed, known as chit, we transfer the grains to a temperature-controlled germination vessel. During the malting stage, the barley grains start to produce a wide range of hydrolytic enzymes, and the outer endosperm wall is broken down. Finally, we can place the grains in a kiln to halt any further germination. Malted grain is a good source of proteins in reducing sugars. So by adjusting the kiln time and temperature, we can influence the degree of Maillard browning that takes place. This makes a wide range of crystal and speciality malts possible that can give complexity to the odor, color, flavor, and viscosity of the beer. However, pale malts made at low kiln temperatures are still the primary ingredient of most beers, as this is the best source of intact amylase enzymes that are needed in mashing. During mashing, we combine milled malt, known as grist, with warm water to make a solution called sweet wort. We have two objectives here. First, we want to extract as much starch from the grains as possible. And second, we wish to break that starch down to a mixture of fermentable sugars and maltodextrins. As with all cereal crops, like wheat, rice and corn, barley starch is comprised of two types of molecule, amylose and amylopectin. Both of these consist of long chains of glucose, joined by alpha links in the 1 and 4 position. The main difference is that whilst amylose is linear and helical, amylopectin branches every 20 to 30 units. This gives the starches very different behaviours that make them useful as thickeners and gelling agents in a wide range of foods. At the start of the mashing process, we initially hold the water at about 38 degrees Celsius. At this temperature, enzymes responsible for breaking down fibre and hazing proteins have the greatest effect. We will then raise the temperature up to the so-called brewer's window between 64 and 70 degrees C. This is where the amylases are most effective. We have two main amylases at work. Alpha amylase operates best at between 68 and 72 degrees C. This endoenzyme breaks the 1,4 bonds in starch at random places turning each individual chain into several shorter chains called maltodextrins. These molecules thicken the wort, giving the final product body. Beta amylase operates best at slightly lower temperatures. This exoenzyme can only work from one end of the starch chain, liberating a unit of maltose each time. These smaller disaccharides can be directly used by yeast to make alcohol. Therefore, as our mashing temperature rises above 65 degrees, we decrease the potential fermentability of our wort, but increase the viscosity. Today we will compromise by mashing at 67 degrees C for an hour. After that we will mash out by raising the temperature to 75 degrees. 
At this slightly higher temperature, the water is a more efficient solvent for starch extraction, and any extra will largely be converted into maltodextrins. We then remove the grist from the wort and drain. As there's still some starch left in the grains, we will gently sparge using fresh water at 80 degrees C. If we were to use boiling water here, we would also start to extract some unwanted bitter and burnt flavours from the grist. The next stage is to boil the wort. The main reason for this is to sterilise the liquid ahead of pitching our yeast, but we get some added benefits, including a decrease in pH, coagulation of some of the hazing proteins, and formation of a wider range of colours and flavours. We also need to boil the wort so as to extract compounds from another major ingredient, hops. Hops are the dry flowers of Humulus lupus, but we can also use Humulus japonicus and Ioannensis. These flowers were originally added to beer to improve its keeping quality, but they also provide a desirable bitter flavour and flowery citrus notes. Hops contain three major groups of compounds that give flavour and aroma to the beer. Alpha acids provide the bulk of bitterness in beer. Boiling hops improves the extraction of these compounds from hop resin and also dries their isomerization into much more bitter forms. The longer hops are boiled, the more bitter the resulting beer will be. Beta acids are poorly water soluble and as such contribute more to the aroma of beer than to its bitterness, at least when we're using fresh hops. However, as these compounds are oxidized, they will become more water soluble and also more bitter meaning that they can cause brews to become more bitter if stored for an extended period of time. Whilst hops only contain about 3% essential oil, this provides a wealth of flowery, herby and citrus flavours and aromas. As these compounds are all volatile, they're lost upon extended boiling. As such, whilst many traditional real ale recipes only require hops to be added at the beginning of the boil, craft beer recipes will also call for hops to be added at the end, or even for dry hopping. This is where we would add hops to the wort after it had cooled. The later we add hops to the boil, the more of the volatile content will be retained. About 10 minutes before the boiling is finished, we'll also add some Irish moss. This is the common name for Crondus crispus, a type of red algae that is a rich source of kappa carrageenan. This molecule is soluble in water above 60 degrees C, and when added to bitter wort, which is at about pH 5, it will form a negatively charged molecule. At this same pH, many of the remaining hazing proteins in the wort will be positively charged. These two species will then be attracted to each other and they'll form a complex with an overall neutral charge. This means that the complex will drop out of solution and we get less hazing in the resulting beer. With our home brewing setup, we don't have the option to whirl the bitter wort to remove any of the sediment. Luckily, by using a hot basket, we can at least keep the larger chunks of debris away from the beer. We can then cool the beer with a countercurrent chiller. This runs off a garden hose. And then we can pump the bitter wort into a sterilized fermentation vessel. Probably the most important rule for home brewing is to keep everything scrupulously clean and to sterilize everything that will make contact with the cooled bitter wort. I'll then check the original gravity of the beer using a hydrometer and then I'll whisk the cooled beer with a beer paddle to get lots of air into the solution. Yeast is a facultative anaerobe. It doesn't need oxygen to convert sugars into alcohol. However, it does need oxygen to create cholesterol, and cholesterol is a vital part of the yeast cell membrane. Ergo, by adding extra oxygen to the wort, we can speed up the fermentation time because it will be easier for the yeast cells to replicate. After placing the fermentation vessel somewhere reasonably warm, we can pitch the yeast. This time I picked a freeze-dried California ale yeast, which will get the job done in less than a week. Different yeasts can tolerate different final alcohol levels, and will also produce a different profile of cogena compounds that add to the flavour and aroma of beer. For example, a saison would be made using a yeast that would also contribute a range of esters, which would add a fruity note to the beer. We'll then seal the unit and place an airlock filled with dilute vodka in the top. This allows the beer to vent carbon dioxide without allowing natural yeasts or bacteria from the outside to contaminate the fermenting beer. When the fermentation is complete, we can take a final gravity reading. By using this equation, we can see that the beer has achieved 5% alcohol by volume. We will then add a small quantity of priming sugar, I prefer to use honey, 
and then transfer the beer to sterilised amber bottles. This small amount of sugar will be used by the live yeast left in the beer to undergo a secondary fermentation. This is what's going to make the beer fizzy. The beer will be ready to drink in about a week, though leaving for a few more weeks will give a beer that has a much more developed flavour and an even better clarification. Well, there we are. I hope you enjoyed learning some of the science behind homebrew. We're off to enjoy the weather and now a quiet pint. See you all next time.